Hello and welcome to Creating Canon with your hosts, AJ Hamilton and Nebraska Cindy Prostitute. Yay! Yay! You know, since being under uh, stay at home orders, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I've forgotten my own name. So well, that's all right. That's okay. So Nebraska Cindy Prostitute is, is what you're going to find. It's, it's what you're going to go with. That seems yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. And Nicholas C. Pappas. Is that my real name? That's what it is, man. Oh, my God. How does that fit you? Uh, not as good as Nebraska Cindy Prostitute, but... That's true. No. It, it fits me okay. Knowing knowing you, uh, the other one is better. But yeah. uh, we don't choose our names. We choose our lives, you know? <laughs> Which is why mm-hmm. Nebraska Cindy Prostitute is now is is your life. Perfect. Yep. <laughs> oh boy. Oh man. This so, this week. This week. Oh, well, man. before we start that, we should mm-hmm. mention that this is our second under quarantine. Well, it's not technically quarantine. Yeah. It's... Under stay at home orders. Correct. Episode. Yeah. So I will throw out that if you hear some barking, that is my asshole dogs. <laughs> um, not much I can do about it. Hopefully it's to a minimum. No, yeah, it's uh, it's gonna be fine. They're welcome guests yes, on the on the they, podcast. They are. Yep. We've ne- um, we've never had my cats on, but uh, maybe we should ugh. we should do that sometime. I mean, they, it would have been great for uh, Puss in Boots, but they yes, just it would have been. They just, I mean, they really didn't have that uh, nuanced of an opinion on it. Well, well they also you got to be honest. Yeah. Um, they're not fans of christopher walken they're not it's weird no. and no, they no, will no, no. they will do everything to avoid they watch pulp fiction and for those six minutes in in the middle of the movie yeah they just they, tune they leave the, the fuck room. out yeah exactly they leave the room it's so it's sad really yeah it really is they don't get it but apparently um you heard it here today folks all cats hate christopher walken <laughs> even the ones in cats the movie yes hate christopher yeah. walken and Let's start that boots. feud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's because he turned it down. He was going to be old Deuteronomy. <laughs> but you know who would have done great at old Deuteronomy? Oh, Michael. Old Michael Dudikoff. Dudikoff. Oh, wow. Yes. I bow down to your <laughs> transitional skills right there, my well, friend. there you are. That's the podcast as far as I'm concerned. Wrap so it done. up. Oh, God, yes. we are done. We didn't even talk about what the movie title is, let alone. <laughs> Holy shit. Yep. Yep. We watched a movie this week yes. uh, called Rescue Me from 1992, starring the Duder. Yep. Mr. Um, Duder also Cup. starring Stephen Dorff in like a very young role. Tiny baby Stephen Dorff. My tiny, God. It's weird to think that the kid in that movie turned out to be the Stephen Dorff that I know because right? Stephen Dorff in every movie he's in is sort of like, whether he is or not, but I feel like he sort of uh, is the epitome of cool. Yeah. Yes. And in this movie, he is not he had, cool. He had not taken the dude uh, lessons to heart yet. Yeah. You know? It was interesting. Also, if you listened last week, mm-hmm. you probably, in our next week on, we proclaimed that this movie yes. was a prequel to Dennis Leary's series, Rescue Me. <laughs> yeah, it was not. Oh, I actually thought it was. I oh, think Stephen th- Dorff's character grows up, grows to, up be to be a firefighter. a firefighter. Yeah, after he goes to Columbia, spoiler alert. <laughs> and what a spoiler it is um, yes. for for such a, a high stakes movie. Yep. 1992 gave us Basic Instinct, Reservoir Dogs, and Rescue Me. What a year for film. My yeah. goodness. Yeah, this uh, this movie, uh, it, it went. It, it, <laughs> it, uh, it proceeded in a forward order. Uh, it and did. Things happened because of other things, and then, uh, the, or they didn't. Why don't, why don't you give us a, a, a breakdown, a rundown? Yeah what this well, movie was about. Well, one thing I will say okay. is, and, and this is only based off of your suggestion, uh-huh. where you sent me the trailer for this movie. Oh my goodness. Um, watch the trailer, yep. because that is not what this movie is. <laughs> I'll include a link to that trailer as well. Yeah, that was that was nuts, because that's not what this movie was. The trailer starts out narrated by the female lead. Yes, who, when you say lead, I would use that term... It, very loosely. Yeah, I mean, she is probably the most featured woman in this movie. Yes, yes, but uh, she's probably the fifth 
highest screen time. Yes, yeah. And also sort of just the object of the movie rather than yeah. the subject. Yeah. You know? Well, here, let me read my plot. Please Because do. I think this actually will encapsulate it mm-hmm. um, really well. <clears throat> Go ahead. When Ginny gets kidnapped, her unhinged stalker teams up with a post-traumatic Vietnam vet to hunt her down and save her. Once this adventure starts, it's all downhill from here, kids. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Yeah, I, li- I liked that. Uh, it's all downhill from here, kids. Uh, yeah. It, you know what's funny is for the longest time, I thought it's all downhill from here meant that it's going to be bad. But it's actually it actually means it's going to be easier. It's all downhill yes, that's from here. What I th- I always thought it would it was that it was easier, like the world gets easier from this point forward. Interesting. Okay. But in the movie, yeah. the way he says it's all downhill from here makes it sound like that it's, it's all bad... more difficult from this point forward. Well, I don't know. He uses it in a couple of different situations, and uh, it, it's not consistent. Uh, I would no, blame the writing. Uh, I would I would blame the writing, not uh, not Dudikoff, because I don't blame Dudikoff for anything. No, no. Well, the tutor. Oh. Man, what did you he think? Is. What did you think about him in this movie? Oh, I actually have a note that says Dudikoff is not meant to be a tough guy. <laughs> uh, he's also not meant to be a bad guy. But that beard, man, it really uh, roughed him up. He was. I he's actually a tough think this guy. is like one of the best Dudikoff has looked. Honestly, and he looked great. He looked great. You're right. He doesn't really fit the the role completely. Well, because everything about the bad guy is this is Dudikoff playing. Somebody who might be considered bad. <laughs> Where it's like, yeah, he does that like affected voice thing. Mm-hmm. Like he actually puts on a gravelly, grumpy voice. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's... Which eventually he loses when we find out that he's not actually a bad guy. Right. He's he's the anti-hero yeah. kind of guy. This movie opened up. <laughs> I I had the same like just holy shit. This is this is the most kind of disturbing kind of. Uh, not bait and switch, but it's kind of just completely inappropriate because it's it's a it's it's essentially <laughs> probably for teens, right? I mean, for yes. for kids, it's a there's not much blood at all. Uh, there's one instance at the end, not too violent, not too sweary. Well, actually, the violence at the end it's weird because there's a lot of shooting in this movie. Sure, but at the end, there's like violence, violence. Yeah, where I was like, oh my god, where did that come from? Exactly. Yeah, like. And and that's the and that's the odd tonal things that this uh, this movie gets wrong. I have tone written down like forty five times. Like, what is the tone of this movie? But the tone that it starts out with is it cuts back between two different shower scenes. Uh, yes. Essentially, yes. starting on the uh, the top of the chests and going down the breasts. Well, it starts with the hair. Oh, it starts with the hair. You're right. You're right. I- I don't know about you. I was super confused because it's definitely like a girl's head. Right. And then it shows like shorter like, hair. But because it was wet, it was a little unclear. Agreed. So when they got to the point where they show them, it was like, so it's a female in the shower and a male in the shower. So when it got to the point of showing the chest. Yes. And like the nipples of the boy. Uh-huh. I was like, that girl's Wait. got really weird hairy nipples. Yep. Exactly. Now, did we see a cut between the the girl's chest and the boy's chest, or was it always just the guy? It was only the boy's chest, okay. and then we see the girl's stomach. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. That makes sense. And then we see was... the boy's hairy legs. Yeah. And then the girl's uh, feet, like the with feet. with the uh, toenail polish. Yes. Yeah. But it was actually at this point. I got to be honest, AJ. Um, it wasn't until this point where I realized it was two people showering because there's the one scene where, and I got to ask you because yeah. I think this should be a poll question we put out to listeners. Yes. There's the scene where we f- eventually find out it. the character's name is Fraser, played by Stephen Dorff, yep. is the male in the shower, and uh, Ginny, played by Amy Dolans, is the female mm-hmm. in the shower. And to be also clear, they're not in the same shower. They're showering in their own separate homes. Yep. But Stephen Dorff's character puts soap in between his, his toes. toes. Yeah. Do you, do you wash in between your toes like that? Um, not really. No. I don't either. No. Okay. No, I just let it, the water go down on them. I fig like yes. I figure that that's enough. Yeah, yeah. It's always nice when someone goes down on, on, your, on toes. your toes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, ask Quentin Tarantino. 
Uh, hey! Man. Um, but it wasn't until that moment where we see his toes. Mm-hmm. And again, I was like, that lady's got really hairy legs. Yeah, what? And then it cut to her toes, and I was like, oh, oh it's two, two different, different people. people. And also, here's a problem that I see as well. It, they are in high school. Both yes. of them say at one point or another that they're almost 18 or something like to that, uh, which just means that you've been ogling two young people's bodies. It's kind of creepy. Yes. Well, I mean, it is a 90s movie. Oh, it, it definitely is. It um, definitely is. So there is that. Yeah. And then the other thing that I think is really important is that that means they, I mean, they both say that they are 18. Or nearly 18. Nearly so 18. Or 17. Sure, sure. But the age of consent in Nebraska is 16. So that's what this movie takes place. So it's Great. completely okay. Good. Still feels weird. And and the fact that you say Nebraska, it was not evident at all. I was I, shocked. I actually, well, the funny thing is, it's because they didn't shoot in Nebraska. I checked all of the places where they shot, and it was Northern California. Uh, actually, was it, it was to be. it was Auburn. The school was in Sacramento. They shot somewhere in Gra- Sackdown. Yeah. And uh, they shot in Grass Valley and a couple other places. Was, was any of it shot in um, Los Angeles? Yes. Yeah. The okay. uh, the parts that were in Los Angeles were actually in Los Angeles. The ending part, basically, I mean, the last 30 minutes, half an hour, half an hour takes place so. in Santa Monica, I would say, Del Mar, but they say, different stuff. Yes. Although it was weird because they do say Venice, I believe. Oh, um, sure. Even sure, though sure. it is clearly Santa Monica Pier. Obviously. Yeah, yeah, I don't. I don't it's know. It's got the famous carousel. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> oh my god, this movie. Well, the timeline in this movie, and we'll get to it throughout, but I yeah. do want to say partly that they drive from Nebraska to Los Angeles in seemingly like two days. Yeah, something like I... that. Well, they go from Nebraska to Vegas in seemingly one day. One day, right? Yes, and then from Vegas to los angeles in like 20 hours <laughs> yes because, exactly um and i just looked it up nebraska to los angeles is approximately 20 to 21 hours yeah. of a drive with no traffic mm-hmm. and vegas to los angeles and i've driven this enough in my life mm-hmm. to know it's about four it's, hours it's about a four hour drive yeah so they leave vegas in the morning <laughs> And they get to Los Angeles, and they're like, oh, let's just sleep on this beach because we're so tired. <laughs> and I'm like, that does not, timeline does not, add, I mean, all throughout this movie, timeline does not add up. You know what? That's the end of the movie, though. We should exactly. Go yeah. How did we get there? That's a great question. I don't know. How did they oh, get there? Oh, my God. So this kid, Steven Dorff, a.k.a. Fraze, a.k.a. Frazier, uh, he is a photographer, which never comes up again in the movie. I mean, I guess, I guess it's a running theme for a while, but... He takes a bunch of pictures of his crush, Jeannie, uh, and she is yeah. she is dating the the football captain or probably star guy. He's actually well, funny enough. This guy uh, Todd Danny Nucci is from Titanic. He's uh, Jack's best friend that stows yes. away with him. He's also in the movie Alive. If you oh. remember, he's one of the uh, the Peruvian soccer team players. Oh wow! Does yeah. he get eaten? Um, I haven't seen Alive in a million years. Yeah, okay. But I'm assuming he does, because I think the only one who survives at the end is uh, Ethan Hawke, so... Yeah, that's um, probably eating him. Uh, yeah. That's fair. Uh, I think he's also yeah. in a in a TV show called The Fosters or something like that. Is he? Yeah, uh, he's, he's still working. Uh, yeah. He's a cool guy. Uh, he's a fine... He was a young actor in this. Yes, he was very uh, young. Let's say... Uh, <laughs> well, before before we get to him, there's one thing that I do want to point out, Please. which is where we go directly from uh, the shower sequence yeah. to Phrase following Ginny on his moped, which is a very loud moped, <laughs> while she is walking. Yes. And he's just staring at her, like, drooling. And she kind of turns around and, like, smiles at him. Um, and then... He is, this is actually, I think, my favorite line of dialogue in the movie. What's that? Is when um, he's in science class, and oh. she is doing a cheerleading routine outside. and On um, the front yard of the on school. On the front yard of the school. Sure. Um, and he's, like, just staring at her, and he can't take his eyes off of her. And it's it's actually creepy. Like, it's 
it's not like endearing it's creepy yeah to the point where he doesn't know what chemicals he's pouring into <laughs> other chemicals um and he accidentally lights his book on fire mm-hmm. and that's when the teacher who is i think she's my new favorite actress of all mm-hmm. time mm-hmm. looks at him and goes i'll have to revoke your bunsen burner privilege. privileges <laughs> which <Yeah>. i <laughs> was like what? Ooh, that's great. And then that's when we find out he's the school photographer for the um, yearbook. Yeah. Because he is now taking pictures of Jenny while she is doing the cheerleading routine mm-hmm. at the um, big pep rally. Sure. And his friend is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You gotta, you gotta, you know, stop that because Todd, who is Danny Nucci, mm-hmm. is going to kick your ass if you keep taking pictures of her. Yeah, right. Which, he... at this point, oh my we've established that he follows her. Yep. He can't do anything but watch her. And not only has he taken pictures of her before, he's taken so many pictures mm-hmm. of her that people have noticed and asked him to quit. Yep. Um, and then he says the line where he goes, oh, she's got great cheeks. Oh, man. Which, yeah, I feel like because the movie was PG-13, mm-hmm. that, that line was 80 yard from... Some form of breasts. Oh, to could be, could be. It's also, it's still uh, possibly a double entendre. Who Maybe. Knows? But... Who knows? Well, and then to ramp up the stalkerishness even more, Todd goes over to his girlfriend, Jeannie, and gives her a note. Yes. And that's when Frazier takes a picture of the note, like zooms in and takes a picture, a couple of them, to figure out what the note says. Yes. Oh. Well, so I'm going to give Frazier just a little bit of credit here. Okay. In that I think he was just taking pictures of her. He noticed. He tried to get, he timed it. I don't, well, maybe. I don't know. Uh, Because he does seem rather surprised later on in the movie where he looks at the note. But what I will say is before Todd hands Ginny the note, Ginny goes up to Frasier and is like, take my picture. Take a bunch of pictures. Oh, right. He takes a bunch of pictures of her and she goes, am I going to get a page in the yearbook? And he's like, oh, it's done, baby. It's done. Totally. And then later on when Todd is like, hey, fuck face, I told you to stop taking pictures of my girlfriend. Frasier shows Todd a picture of Todd. Yep. And he's like, hey. It's going to be your own page in the yearbook. And Todd's like, oh my God, that's so great. Oh, you're so cool, like, dude. All right. Never mind then. Thanks. Like, were you obsessed with having a. First of all, did your school have whole pages in the yearbook to get dedicated to like a single student? Uh, parents had to buy pages for their kids. That's what I, yes. And I, they never or like, you had featured to die. anybody. That or you it. had to like, die. Sure. Yeah, a exactly. Parents bought a page or you had to die. Right. So, no, I mean, uh, they would dedicate it to clubs or yes. uh, teams or whatever, but never one single person. Apparently, at this school, if you were uh, popular enough, then you got your own uh, page in the yearbook. So, yes, I mean, it, it's Nebraska. It's a different a different country. It's, a, it's completely different. Uh, I've yeah. been to Nebraska oh, I'm sorry. Nine, nine different times in my life. Wow. Okay. And it is... Even though it is within the United States of America, yep. it is a different country. See? I will tell you that. I didn't, I've never even been, but I knew it. That's, yeah. that's where my great grandparents grew up. So, oh, really? Yeah. Um, What's so great about them? <laughs> nothing anymore. No. Because oh. when you're dead, you lose that. <laughs> um, so, eventually, Phrase looks at this picture that he's developed mm-hmm. to find what the note said like he finds out what the note said Mm -hmm. but before that i do want to point out that there is this one really great moment Mm -hmm. considering our current society oh where um the the mother character this was a thing that i just didn't understand in the movie at all because there is this like side plot where phrase keeps asking his mom how grandma is oh right yeah and grandma is sick and like it doesn't pay off in any way. We never meet grandma. He never has to do anything for grandma. But she has this line where she goes, a little touch of the flu and the whole world has to stop. Oh. And I literally thought to myself, yeah. did Donald Trump write that line? Yeah. Oh, God. Well, the I think the one reason that we dealt with grandmother was so that the mother would be away and not worrying about phrase while he was on his adventure. And I, this because two to seven day adventure, depending. Right. Who the fuck knows? Uh, yeah. So I, I think that was the only plot convenience so that, that makes sense that we wouldn't worry. Like she wouldn't 
uh, be calling him or or worrying about him for the uh, for the rest of the movie. That makes sense. You, you're probably right. I don't that know. does, but that means it's very convenient because they do sleep. They do go to bed four times in the movie. I believe so. They yeah. being um, Fraze and this character named Mac, played by Dudikoff, who we'll meet in a second. Yep. But that's an awfully long time for her to just not notice her son has disappeared. Well, he was 17, and she was leaving him alone. He was she was that's true. she was going to visit Grandma in a yeah. another state. I don't know. No, it was that city. What the? F- then w- was she staying with her for that entire time? I think time? so. Okay, then that makes sense. None of this makes but, sense. Uh, no, it really doesn't. And a lot of these things, there's it's it's like the writer just wanted to skip from plot point to plot point rather than putting any reason into any of it. Yes. So what what you were saying about uh, him seeing the note? Well, it says that Jeannie should meet Todd down at the river at three yep. o'clock. And stalker phrase looks at his watch and he's like, Oh, he he also says too because yeah. this is very important. Don't bother to bring your swimsuit. Oh yeah, sexy. But yeah, yeah, here's yeah. here's the thing about the note. He says, "Meet me at the river." Yes, I had the same fucking problem. Meet me at the river at three o'clock. Well, our stalker phrase goes over to the river to take pictures yep. of Ginny and I guess Todd for their pages, you know, respectively. Yep. And he's up in a tree watching. Both Ginny and Todd show up at the river together in Todd's car. So yes, why did he? But, yes. But before Ginny and Todd show up, there is this really weird fucking thing that happens where we're 10 minutes into the movie. Because I actually wrote this down because I checked timing. Mm-hmm. We're now 10 minutes into the movie. Phrase shows up at the river. And that's when Dudikoff pulls in on a motorcycle. Vroom. And that's the first shot of Dudikoff, mm-hmm. um, who plays Mac. And Mac just so happens to be doing some sort of what looks like a drug deal. Yep, it's an exchange of money for something. Yes, with these two characters named Kurt and Rowdy. (laughs) Um, They're they're amazing. Who the fuck knows? Yep. And then, at this point, Phrase is taking all these pictures Mm -hmm. of what's happening. Mm -hmm. And that's when Ginny and Todd show up together. Not meeting each other at the river. Yep. Showing up at the river together. Together. Sure. And immediately, Kurt and Rowdy are like, what the fuck's going on? And they start shooting their guns. Mm-hmm. Todd runs away. <laughs> what a, and for what an whatever idiot. reason, Kurt and Rowdy go out of their way to kidnap Jenny. Yeah, of course. And it, now the plot has started. And and I guess it was kind of that they were using her as a uh, human shield-ish? Because they, in, eh. they ended up stealing max uh dudikoff's backpack and the money that they brought for him yes so they got both of those so at this point logically you would think okay so what's going to happen is phrase is going to fall out of the tree and he and mac are going to meet up and phrase is going to say they stole my girl and he was like they stole my money well We've got a common thing. Let's go and Let's get go the fucking it. movie started. Nope. What happens is Phrase screams Ginny's name like 19 times. Yeah. He's only just barely across the river. Yeah. No one hears um, him. Dudikoff hops on his motorcycle, leaves. We cut into the car with uh, Kurt, Rowdy, and Ginny. Mm-hmm. Kurt and Rowdy are like, what do we do? What do we do? Rowdy's a moron. Yeah. He's the kind of stupid that... Um, if you were watching a cartoon and the character had Rowdy's intelligence level, you'd be like, this is unbelievable. He reminded me a lot of the character in Revenge of the Nerds. Um, Booger? Uh, yeah. Well, no, well, he he looks like a cross between Booger and Ogre, I would say. Ogre, too. Yeah, yeah. I can see the Ogre face right? as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, definitely, definitely that kind of intelligence as well yeah Uh, jesus man this was almost the archetype of the 90s villain though you know both of these guys there was there was the semi-smart serious one the harry straight out of harry um, and marv yeah harry and marv i mean it's it's two years after home alone actually came out Mm -hmm. so 
it feels it, ripped directly from there. It's also ripped from Raising Arizona, which is oh uh, sure what about a decade before this movie. Oh came yeah, out. absolutely. My guess is that everything Rowdy was doing on set, the actor playing Rowdy, who is uh, his name is Peter De Louise, mm-hmm. um, everything he was doing on set, they were like, oh my god, this is gold. Keep going, Com- keep going. Complete like, improv, yeah. Which it wasn't. <laughs> But, Yikes. but basically Rowdy's like, what do we do? Kurt's like, I don't know why you kidnapped a girl. That made no sense whatsoever. <laughs> like, they actually call that out in the plot. Yeah, and Rowdy's yeah. like, I guess we'll just let her go. And um, Kurt is like, like no, now she she's knows. Seen us. Who cares? That's fine. Yep. Whatever. Okay. But then Jimmy goes, my dad's rich. He, he, he owns a, a bank. bank. He owns a bank. He owns a bank. And then they're like, cool. We're going to hold you for ransom. Sure. Done. And at this point, like I said, the two leads don't get together and go off onto the adventure. No. Our phrase goes to the bank where, for some reason, they are interviewing Todd about the events. And Todd is like, I was, I I was such a I, hero. I, and they Yeah, still, I tried to know, stop I, it. And they had guns. Did I tell you they had guns? And just as a, uh, a fuck you to Todd... Phrase comes in and tosses him his own keys, the keys to the car that Todd was driving earlier. Which was amazing because that really pays off later in the movie when there's the moment where Phrase and Todd have the big showdown. Right. Oh, that would have been great if it actually fucking happened. Oh, wait, that's right. That's the last time we see Todd. Yeah, in that's this movie. it. That's the that's, right. that's the, the end of that. Uh, that character got his comeuppance. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's when um, Freya's overhears the two reporters talking about how the, there was a kidnapping last year and the cops couldn't find the kidnappers, mm-hmm. even though they knew what they looked like. They actually found the girl cut up into pieces because um, it's better to be a corpse than habeas corpus. <laughs> <laughs> God, this, this movie has uh, such yeah. good lines. Oof. Quotable. Yes, it's quotable. quotable. And then that's when, because Phrase is there to basically turn over the pictures, but finds out that the pictures won't actually do anything. So what he right. decides to do is develop the pictures himself. And then, I don't know how this worked out, but he shows up at the same exact biker bar. Just a local bar walking through. That Mac happens to be drinking at. Yep. And this was one of my favorite moments of the movie is Phrase looks through yep. a window, watches an entire bar fight break out. <laughs> And as the bar fight's breaking out, he walks around the window to the front of the door to go in. And by that time, the owner of the bar, a woman named Carney, uh, Carney played by Liz Torres, mm-hmm. breaks up the fight. And Freya walks in. Yeah. And what's amazing about that is the logic of what happened in that moment is Freya sees a bar fight break out. And he's like, I'm going to go in anyways. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, um, haven't you ever seen a movie with a bar in it? That's pretty standard fare. There's always a true. bar bar that fight you know it's Especially it's kind of just biker bar. In the, exactly so it's just par for the course yeah and this is where it gets super weird is that again uh, i mean like this is where it gets super like, weird that's what that's what i mean is like the fact that they didn't have any interaction at the river yeah is so frustrating to not know how they would ever meet up again Exactly. It didn't make sense that Mac wasn't gone out of town. It didn't make sense that Frazier would have seen any bar and just... Yeah. Also, he's spending time developing these pictures. Photos. Because what he does is he shows the photos to Mac, and Mac is like, what the hell do you want from me? (laughs) And Frazier goes, if you don't take me to your friends, I'm going to turn these over to the police. And Mac is like, they're not my friends. Of course, we have to have that conversation. Yeah. But this is where the movie got super wild for me. Because at this point, Phrase goes, you have till 10 o'clock to decide. He gets up and he leaves the bar. Yeah. It is pitch black outside. He goes home. He deals with his mom. He deals with this. He deals with that. And then he comes back to the bar. Yeah. And Frazier is still at the bar. And Frazier doesn't, like, murder him. Nope. 
Fraser doesn't punch him in the face. Fraser's like, eh, I thought about it. Let's go. Yeah, let's do this. And this is like, okay. again, the timeline. I actually thought it was like midnight when he went to that Me bar. too. I didn't realize it was like 6 p.m. Well, it would have made more sense that he'd been searching for yes. a bunch. But yes. no, no, this is all Not happening all. In, uh, in a couple of hours, couple of days, you know. And yeah. what the fuck? It took forever for this movie to start. Yeah. Like, start rescuing me. Yes, to start the rescuing. <laughs> And then as they're leaving the bar, this woman who goes by the name of Cherry, which is spelled Cherry with a soft Oh, it was Sherry. Sherry. Yeah, sorry. Sherry just plants one on Dudikoff Mm -hmm. and, like, makes out with her. Yep. And Fraser watches and he's like, oh, my God. And then she looks at Fraser and she's like, what's your name? He's like, Fraser. And she plants the same kiss on Fraser. Yeah. And he's like, what? You you know in the cartoons where, like, the girl bunny... (laughs) kisses the boy bunny Mm -hmm. and the boy bunny's feet lift off and he's like floating in air Mm -hmm. yeah for the kiss yep that's basically what happens oh yes i'm to the point where fraser later in the movie says he's in love with cherry (laughs) now that i thought that that was kind of a cute moment because it shows how as a as a young boy who doesn't know anything about love where he's like you can mistake being obsessed or being infatuated with somebody with love yeah and i agree because i do want to talk about that moment particularly a little bit later when it happens because um oh and this is also the first instance where judikoff is like she kissed you and he's like yeah and he's like it's all downhill from here kid from here you know, once that kiss, first kiss, uh, it's all downhill from yeah. here. Oh, and then there's a weird beat where when they're getting on Mac's bike, uh, Phrase goes back into the bar and says, hey, Sherry, here. And he throws her his keys to his moped, just yeah. like, oh, you can have it now. And she looks so like, oh, my God, thank Aww, you. Oh, that's so cute. Also, too, at that point, he starts to turn around and walk away. Mm-hmm. And Carney walks up and she's like. Let me tell you something about Mac. Mac's a good boy. He's not who you think he is. Don't worry. He's on your side. And I was like, why are all the bikers Thank you. suddenly his friend? Thank like, you, Exposition Fairy. Jesus Christ. Yes, but it made no sense because you'd think like the bikers would be like, who the who, fuck are you? This what kid? the fuck are you doing? Right. Like, yeah, oh. no, there was there was no earned camaraderie in any no. of this movie. And at this point, we jump back to the kidnappers and Ginny. Yep. And I feel like, I don't know about you, but this is a tale of two movies where mm. we've got the Dudikoff Dorf chasing them down movie. Yep. And then we have the Rowdy Ginny movie. And the Rowdy oh, Ginny, because they're... Because they fight in the backseat like brother and sister. They push each other. They <laughs> yeah. slap each other. Mm-hmm. To the point where the Kurt character who is like the uh, kidnapper who is the smarter one, yeah. is like, God damn it, it's like I got a couple of kids back there. <laughs> um, but they like slap each other and hit each other, and Ginny just keeps pushing Rowdy, and Rowdy's got like a fucking gun pointed at her head. Yeah, yeah, and but she like, doesn't care. Funny enough, she has the same problem as the female lead in the other Dudikoff movie that we've... Yeah, American Ninja. American Ninja, where she's just... She doesn't understand what the situation is. She the is just of the town. No, she just doesn't have any realistic personality in yes. this. Yeah, and and her whole entire personality is basically I'm gonna try to trick Rowdy mm-hmm. into thinking I want him, and then when he lets me go, I'm gonna run away. Yeah, and then she does it again. Yeah, she does it a couple um, of times, and Kurt actually warns her off of it. He's like, "Hey, listen, Rowdy's he's he's fucked up." He, yeah, he's it, dumb. He, well, no, not even that. It's just like it. It felt like she, he was warning her, saying like, "I know what you're doing," and he's gonna take it way too far. Well, yeah, I think that's exactly what he was saying. He's like, I mean, I hate to use this term, but I think what he was saying was like, "Listen, mm-hmm. if you don't stop, he'll rape you." Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and if he rapes you, we're gonna have to kill you mm-hmm. because there's no way we can let you go back to your dad. Nope. After that yeah what was that uh phrase about i'm not gonna return a uh a damaged damaged goods goods? yeah something gross like that yeah um which is weird because look i don't know how to say this right like if those characters were scary Mm -hmm. and not presented as goofy and silly yeah i would have found that moment to be chilling yeah and actually a well-written moment Mm -hmm. but because rowdy is so goofy and silly Mm -hmm. I mean, he does that thing where, like, if someone asks him a question, he's like, oh, 
and he like makes that face where he's thinking and I'm processing confused. and then and then responds with like oh uh oranges are orange <laughs> and they're like yes rad and he's like oh, oh okay good 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 <laughs> um like that's practically what they like that's him so like mm-hmm. to have that silly tone with the he'll rape you thing it's it just doesn't work mm. like like i said like now I'm not advocating that he would have physically harmed Jenny, but, but if it's he written like was... that, yes. And I gotta say, this is a note I took much later, and I don't know if you felt this way. Yeah. Again, this is the tale of two movies: mm-hmm. the Dudikoff Dorf movie and the Jenny Rowdy movie. Sure. I really actually enjoyed the Dudikoff Dorf movie. I thought it wasn't bad. I mean, there were there were some inconsistencies in it. Sure. Uh, but some some of it makes logical sense about him becoming sort of the father figure to uh yeah. to dorf and uh you know the the shared experience of uh of this this insanity bringing them yeah. closer together as sort of partners a little bit and i thought that the movie sort of built really mm-hmm. nicely with them coming together and uh coming to an understanding of each other yeah. and and i can actually see how and when they started liking each other mm-hmm. rather than being in it for you know, because he was forced mm-hmm. and all of that stuff. On the flip side, the Rowdy Ginny movie, I hated with the passion of uh, uh, 10 billion songs. I would say that there are a couple of lines that Rowdy said <laughs> that made me laugh, that if they had not been in this movie, if they had been in like a Dumb and Dumber movie or something like that, I, w- sure, I would have course, I would have enjoyed course. it very much. Like uh, uh, his, his in- incredulity of... When Kurt says, oh, she has to take a leak. And he's like, take a leak? She's a girl. I was like, yes. that's actually really funny that that's he is kind of that funny. fucking clueless about whatever. I don't know if you meant to be perfect transition man again. Oh, because yes, that was a perfect transition to the fact that this is now where we are in the plot. Yes, exactly. moment happens. Yeah. They are in a hotel together. Yep. Yeah. In um, fact, I think I've driven by that, if not walked oh, by really? that. Yeah. It's it's kind of on the way to Tahoe, actually. Okay. Yeah. Auburn is. That's awesome. Yeah. Neat little town, you know. Neat little neat little area. Mm-hmm. Neat little place. Yeah. This is when the first time that uh, Mac and Frage actually catch up to Kurt and Rowdy, mm-hmm. um, they run into this hotel. Um, it didn't make any sense how they found that place though well what they there said was like was, a one there was one line where they were like yes. uh we we got intel from somebody from carney from carney i guess but this I, is the only yeah. hotel carney knows okay is what i think fair they enough, said fair enough to be fair yeah i think it's terrible <laughs> yeah i'm not trying to say like no aj it makes perfect sense <laughs> because it doesn't no nothing nothing does um but what I will say is that they did put the ugliest band-aid I've ever seen on that moment. The slightest of effort. I have a feeling this movie had a lot of ADR and a lot of post-production and re-editing, putting things together. Yeah, being like, none of this fucking makes sense. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, I believe that. But at this point, we get the most convenient timing. And this actually, I kind of liked the way this all played out. As much convenience as there is to it. As Mac and Fraze are driving into town, at the same time, Ginny has asked to go to the bathroom. Take a leak. Take a leak, exactly. Yeah, there's no <laughs> way. <laughs> what? She's a girl, though. Uh, and Kurt is currently in the process of shaving, so he has shaving cream on his face. And he's like, all right, fine, go go fucking uh, take a leak. I'll, I'll go in there after you. When she's in the bathroom, she sees Fraze and she starts smacking on the window and trying to get his attention. And then finally just mm-hmm. throws, what did she throw through the window? Like a, not a fucking clue. I, I don't know. Something big in porcelain. It looked like she picked up the sink and threw it out the window. Yeah, honestly, right? <laughs> but I, I don't know how that was possible. I don't either. So she, she does get their attention. They rush in. And they rush up the stairs, and as they're going in, Mr. Santa Claus, the guy running the hotel, he's like, what are you doing? And Dorf actually says, "Uh, it's official business, sorry. And they run upstairs, and they bust in, and Kurt still has the shaving cream on through the Uh entire rest of the conflict, which was kind of cool. I actually liked the continuity, liked the fact that it wasn't just go to this point, we're done, we're moving on to this point. You know, it was it was it actually gave it a little bit of uh, connective tissue. Yeah. And and this is the first time we have like real gunfire in the scene and they're Mm -hmm. shooting at each other. 
uh, the two sides um, back and forth, back and forth. I, I thought there was a great moment where Dudikoff is shooting his gun and the other guys are shooting back at him and his gun gets knocked out of his hand. And then Frazier runs over and picks up the gun and aims it right at Rowdy. And they have this really interesting look. Like, it's the only time I think I liked Rowdy. And Rowdy kind of, like, cocks his head to the side. Uh And both of them are, like, facing off together. And I think both of them are trying to decide, is this kid for real? Right, yeah. And it was a spooky moment. It was the only time I took Rowdy seriously. I agree with you. Yeah. uh, Because... I will also point out that that pays off later in the movie, and we'll get there. But it was a really nice setup to a payoff. It was, it was. Eventually, Rowdy, Kurt, and Ginny get out of the hotel. Mm -hmm. And this was what I thought you were going to say, is there's this really awesome, beautiful shot Mm -hmm. of this door that has like a glass inlay on it. Mm -hmm. And somebody had shot through the glass inlay. Mm. The door is in focus... And you can see the bullet hole. And then it does this, like, rack focus where through the glass bullet hole, you can see where Kurt and Rowdy are shoving Ginny in the car. Mm-hmm. And I just thought it was a very clever shot. It's a very um, cool shot. Yeah. Yeah. I just I thought that was a really good shot. Like, really a great shot. Yeah. You know what's funny is I watched this movie and there is a level of competence to it in at least the filmmaking itself in the, yes. the filming of it. Yeah, I, actually, you're right. I think the you're cinematography right. is fine. It's not revolutionary, but it's 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 workable. None of it feels uh, amateur. Well, the director of this, Arthur Allen Seidelman, mm-hmm. did direct Hercules in New York, which was oh Arnold Schwarzenegger's God. first film. Beautiful. Yeah, back when he was Arnold Strong. <laughs> um, and we know that he has a lot of ADR practice from that movie. Oh uh, Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Sorry. Um... But at this point, there's a huge fucking car chase. Car chase. This is the gunfight. This is the biggest fight in the in the movie, I would say. Yeah. I mean, um, even though there's a there's a fight at the end, it's it's almost not as epic. Well, this I feel like they shot they shot the wad on this. Yeah, because, really. Um, there's a lot of gunfire going back and forth. Windows getting knocked out of cars mm-hmm. as they're shooting. Um, tons of bullets. Um, one of my favorite moments is when Dudikoff is trying to drive a motorcycle and shoot. Yeah. And he realizes he can't, so he hands the gun back to Frey, mm-hmm. so Frey can shoot. And Rowdy hops out of the back of a car with a <laughs> shotgun, and they're shooting. He's shooting shotgun shells at them. Yep, and they are and, still uh, doing fine. Not only are they doing fine, but when the shotgun blast goes past Frey's head, he freaks out and he drops the gun. And Dudikoff is yep. like, "Dude, why'd you drop the gun?" And he's like, <laughs> "In my head, I'm like, because he's getting shot he's at with shot a." The- Fuck up, man. That's a shotgun? Yeah, I I thought that was hilarious. And I also thought it was great. The fact that the shots were basically bouncing off of the uh the motorcycle as motorcycle. As, as if as if it was like uh Captain yes. America's shield on the front yes. of the motorcycle. It's like, oh no, as long as we're behind this small piece of glass and these uh little bits we'll of metal, totally we'll be, be fine. fine. We'll be fine. And he also won't take out the, the front yes. tire. Good lord. Oh, so good. Um, at this point, we cut to a shot where Rowdy and Kurt have gotten out of the car, mm-hmm. and they're standing there with their car in the middle of the road, shooting and just taking pure aim at the motorcycle. Yep. Dudikoff veers that motorcycle off, and I actually loved this, too. When that motorcycle hits that log, mm-hmm. and they go tumbling over the front of that log... Shit, man. They hit so hard. I just thought to myself, they had to have killed the stuntman. Those, yeah, those stuntmen are dead because that was nuts. That was gnarly. Yeah, and it was um, it was shot fairly competently. Again, again, you yeah. know, I mean, it looked and, really good. And this is where they have that great scene where Dudikoff and Dorf are now walking the motorcycle back. Dude, that was to town. One of my in the favorite rain. scenes. Well, this is where they have that conversation that you were talking about mm-hmm. about like. Frey says, I think I'm in love with Sherry. Sherry, sure. And Dudikoff is like... That's that's life, man. You're, that's life, man. That's just you're always You're always going to be in love with somebody or another. Or, and it was such an interesting setting for a bonding moment of yes. this of this forced... You know, they don't have a, a way to a get vehicle. around. And and the rain and the, the dedication that the, both of the actors had to that scene... Yeah, there was a moment, I gotta be honest, there was a moment in that scene where I mm-hmm. thought to myself, oh, shit, Dudikoff can act. Honestly, yeah. And and, and Dorf, I mean, I think Stephen Dorf is a really good actor. I think so, too. Um, I think he was just, 
coming into his own you know it's yeah as a as a young kid you know you don't have the chops that he does now but i mean you could see how good he was then definitely i don't know i keep going back to like i found that to be super fascinating um, I thought that scene was really beautiful. And they had a couple of scenes at, from this point on where yeah. their bond was starting to get stronger. Mm-hmm. I think we kind of glossed over it earlier, but Dudikoff we know is a Vietnam vet because Dorf has found a hat in his backpack. And we find out in that scene that Stephen Dorf's dad was also a Vietnam vet. Right. Who just left the family and disappeared now was that the hat that he brought along that was his dad's no i don't think that was his dad's hat i think that oh, was interesting. Dorf's hat. well because that's what i remember he he goes back home and he opens up the footlocker that was his dad's and he pulled out a hat and something else oh maybe that's what it was that scene was confusing and to me it, it was but there is a cool moment where he puts the hat on and this is before they've gotten really like close and yeah, uh, this is about Dude, to, we're, we're hopping back in time. Yes, exactly. Because there's been a couple of nights where they've been sort of forcing. It's it's a good time for a connection. Yeah, bonding, a bonding moments. moment. You know, it, it feels a bit repetitive sometimes. Yes. But back then, he actually rips the hat off of his head, and he was like, "This is fucking stolen valor. Do mm, do not yes. do not wear that until you fucking earned it." Because a person yes. who was in the army, who was a grunt, who was in Vietnam, is the only person who should wear this fucking hat. Yes. And I, I actually thought that was a very interesting uh, connection that they had. Yeah, it was a nice moment. So when that moment happens earlier in the movie, mm-hmm. and they're sort of like at odds, and now they're pushing the motorcycle in the rain, you can sort of see where Dorf is now looking at Dudikoff as a little bit more of a fatherly figure. Sure. And Dudikoff is looking at Dorf as... Mm, Little brother, if not... I would say little brother. More more. like little brother. Yeah, definitely. To the point where, in this section, and I thought this was really beautiful, in a weird way, Fraze takes out the pictures and the negatives Mm -hmm. and and lights them on fire. And he's basically like, you've done enough. I trust you. Yeah. I don't need to blackmail you anymore, and you can make your own choices. Mm -hmm. Although I want to point out that they are walking in the rain. (laughs) And the envelope is soaking soaking wet. wet. Clear, and he clearly, was able to light it on fire. Clearly, the rain that had gotten on there was infused with kerosene. Yes, because yes. I was thinking I the laughed. exact same thing. I was like, I laugh so hard. And he asks for matches, yes, not even a lighter. Asks, yes, He's, you're right. I'm like, w- stop it. Stop. stop. No, I don't believe it. Just this. have it dry somehow. Yes. What? It's weird because like this is those kinds of like unforced errors that happen right? in movies t- times like where you you're didn't like, need to do it you could have just ripped them or yeah, this could have been a great moment toss them off the of the cliff nobody's gonna find them yes they were yeah, on a exactly. cliff you're right they were on a cliff it was a great moment that then became super funny yeah. because of that <laughs> um they finally get back to the town where the hotel is at yep and they decide what they're gonna do is go into the hotel mm-hmm. and try to get um information the, the in, like information from the hotel owner. I think you dubbed him Mr. Santa Mr. Claus. Mr. Santa which Claus. Is a great name. That's right. They walk into Mr. Santa Claus. They say, We need information. Mm-hmm. Mr. Santa Claus goes, You were the guys here earlier. Mm-hmm. Dudikoff pulls out a 20 oh, and yeah. hands it to Mr. Santa Claus. And just as Mr. Santa Claus takes it to yep. get information, two cops walk down from the crime scene upstairs yeah. and are like, You two were the fellows here earlier, aren't you? Uh oh. And I love this moment because Dudikoff then goes, Thank God, officers. Thank God you're here, officers. Yes. This man tried to bribe me. He rips the money out of Santa Claus's hand, pulls out a badge, shows it, and says DEA. And yeah. Puts it back into his pocket. <laughs> um, this was actually as 90s as it was and, and as silly and you know uh I loved it. alter you know uh, alter ego type of uh yes this this was a great scene i really enjoyed it i did too this part of the movie soared for me because like <laughs> really it gets further where like the cops are asking dudikoff questions mm-hmm. and dudikoff isn't like gets to a point where he's unable to answer mm-hmm. and before they walked in by the way dudikoff says to phrase like you keep your goddamn mouth shut yes you do not talk mm-hmm. i will do the talking when they get inside dudikoff freezes yep and phrase opens up his mouth and the guy's like What's this kid saying? And I thought this was great because Dorf goes, kid, kid, do you know who I am? I am DEA Juvenile Division. Juvenile Division. That was and great. he just goes off on like the accommodation. Like I have more accommodations than all of your entire police Force. crews yep. uh, IQ combined. Like, <laughs> 
Yeah, and just a... he just goes off. It's so fun, so and and he's he's like spouting different uh, made up codes and stuff. And he's like, now what I need you to do is you need to call your dispatch desk and have them trace the calls that we're coming in. We are on a case. Yeah, Do, don't you want us to save the country? And it was great too because I thought the police chief handled this moment really well too yeah, yeah. because. He definitely had that, like, I don't know if I believe you, but... But you're so confident. But you're so confident, so I guess I'll... S- uh, okay, I'm still going to question. Right. And then Dorf's questioning yeah. pushes the, the, the chief further to where the chief is like, nope, you're right, you're right. Yep. And then the deputy is like, do you want to check his badge? And the chief is like, I've already seen his badge, goddammit! <laughs> we gotta do this! Um, which, I, again, I just thought that whole scene, the way it was constructed, the way it was acted, the way it was written. It's pretty beautiful, yeah. And you could see Dudikoff sort of pissed, yep. that phrase, starts talking. Because he's like, oh, then, this is going to blow up in our faces. And then once once he realizes that phrase is handling it really well, mm-hmm. he sort of just gets a smile on his face and he's like, I know to shut up now. Yeah, yeah. And, and he, um, I think he winks at him or something. And, yeah. Yeah, no, this that that was the one of the coolest like little turns of saying yeah. oh shit this kid can handle himself and we can work together this is yeah. gonna be good this is gonna be good i thought that 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 whole bit was great it was really cool um, yeah and they get the phone number they do yes and they find out that the drop is happening in california mm-hmm. so this is when dudikoff and dorf are like well, i guess we're gonna go to california they are and before they go to california before they get back on the road they actually go to a phone bank uh, yes. of of, uh, of pay phones and i really liked this sorry one. what was your what was that thing that you just said a phone bank they're pay, pay, a pay phone right pay yeah phone? they're they're these things right there are these things that used to exist oh when when there were corded phones as well i don't know if you've ever seen those wait uh, what i know right they were just on the street and you would what about my pocket computer why didn't they have one of those i know right you would have oh. thought that they would have had one of those but you had to carry around change and put it into a phone. Change? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, this is. <laughs> it's, you are. It's almost a history lesson. Okay, boomer. <laughs> okay. Oh, my God. But I, I loved this scene right here. Yeah, because was nice little scene there too. was a very cool thing where Dudikoff goes up to one of the payphones and he's going to call the number that they got. Uh-huh. And at the same time, Dorf says, oh, you know what? I should call my mom. And they yep. both step into separate payphone little enclosures, and the dual parallel and mirroring calls, conversations yeah, switch back and forth. And it's actually a really cool aesthetic. It was yeah. it was really cool because it's it's on Dudikoff, and he calls the gangster who they're gonna meet with, and then it switches to the mom answering the phone and saying, what are you doing? And they kind of have a parallel conversation and even their yeah. goodbyes are similar. There's a great beat where they're both talking on the phone and like the criminal says to Dudikoff, is there anyone there with you? Right. And then the mom says to Dorf, is there anyone there with you? Yep. And then it cuts to Dudikoff going, no, it's the, oh, the radio. radio's on. Yeah. And then Dorf goes, uh, the television's on. That was so cool. Yeah. Um, and what I also really liked about it too is uh, this is just one of those great moments where I will actually give the writing a lot of credit here. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's the directing, I don't know. But it's a lot of showing and not telling Yeah, in that it's very clear that they cannot hear each other's conversations, Mm -hmm. but we can see that the two of them are more alike than different because of the way they are saying things. Mm -hmm. And I think at this point, too, we've already found out that Dudikoff was not actually selling drugs. Right. What he is selling is the little stamps that go on cigarette and alcohol packages yep. saying that they are legal. Yes, yeah, um, exactly. He found them in a plane crash in the <laughs> desert, is what he said. <laughs> what, a, which, what a great one-liner. What the fuck? Thank you, Wasn't writer. that the whole plot line of that movie, A Simple Plan? <laughs> Holy I shit. I mean, yeah. like, his one-liner was the plot of an entire other movie. <laughs> But, but you know, I'm just gonna I'm gonna leave that alone. <laughs> I wouldn't have wanted to see that. No, no, no. that sounds boring. Yeah, <laughs> um, Dudikoff has had such a more interesting life than this. Than this, this mo- than the mo- what we are seeing yeah, in this th- movie. Th- this week that he spends with this kid. But, yeah. Uh... <laughs> but at this point, they decide, okay, we're gonna follow to California. We're gonna get these guys. Yeah. and We're gonna. And, and they actually have like two days to do it, which is so funny. It was the least stressful ticking clock I've ever yes. seen put into a movie. 
I agree, because it should have been like, the deal's in 12 hours, but... We've got to drive all the way through. Yeah, California's 14 hours away. Let's do it. (laughs) But we've got to have more time for hijinks. Yes, well, and then the next hijink that actually happens is they go directly to Vegas. So they go from Nebraska to Vegas. Is is that where the brothel was with Cindy? Yes, it was in Vegas, because they mentioned that they're in Vegas. Um, Okay, yeah, yeah, I mean, they're not in Vegas, they're just outside of Vegas. In that one place where sex work is legal. Yes, of course. Yeah. But I don't know why they stop at a brothel. And I guess he must walk, know her. Well, Dudikoff knows the owner of the brothel. Right. It seems like. Yes. And then what is amazing is Dudikoff is like, hey, I'm going to go hang out with the owner of this place. <laughs> And the owner goes, who is this? And he's, Dudikoff's like, oh, it's my friend. He's he's a little hungry. You should get him something to eat. Yeah, and then the owner of the brothel's like, Cindy, get over here. Make this boy food. Cindy makes him food and then brings him to the bedroom yeah. and has the most what-the-fuck crazy bonkers monologue oh, about sex my God. and making love and mm-hmm. how you know what I do for a living. And I know this is your first time. But it's sort of like my first time, too. Because because I'm going to take a virginity. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm in control. And don't worry, it's my first time. But I'm really good at it. And, like, Mm -hmm. that monologue, she just keeps talking. And all I could think... And it's all from behind, too. So it's all ADR. (laughs) Um, And I just kept thinking to myself, what is happening here? Mm -hmm. And they have sex. Oh, it was so awkward. They have sex. Yep. Yeah, they do. Um, That was nuts to me. Um, and it's got the most sweet, weird, softcore porn music playing in the background. Yeah, because well, this is this is actually I take that back because I think what Cindy actually says is I want to make love to you. Yes, she does. Yeah, which again furthers that thing where Phrase thinks he's in love with Ginny. It, yeah, it confuses and then he the thinks issue. He's in love with Sherry, and now he's thinks there's love, ma- actual love making going yes, on. Yes, exactly. With Cindy. <laughs> Jesus. On the other side of the world, in the other movie, um, the movie that I hated with Rowdy and Ginny, oh, man. Um, they have appeared in Venice. Venice Beach. At Venice Beach. And to a as, house that they own? Question mark? M- maybe. I, I mean... It's unclear. I thought it would have been funnier if they had just... It was, it was a place where they had murdered some people and they had stolen the house or something like that. Not funnier, funnier, but it would have just right. been like more in character... But of course, well, these are these are definitely like PG villains in a PG thirteen yes. movie. It felt like. Well, it was weird because there was a sign on the front yard that said "for sale." Right. Yet when they got inside, it was fully furnished, mm-hmm. and there was just two photos hanging on the back wall that were clearly cut out of a Playboy. Yeah. <laughs> um. Just two, though. Right. Which I was like, is this somebody selling the house, and they just went to a random house, or are they selling the house? Mm-hmm. Either way, there's a woman who runs out from next door and she's like, Hi, my name's Dawn, spelled D-A-W-N. I'm from Ohio. Because her name is Dawn Johnson. Dawn Johnson, Which was yes. probably a more funny joke back then that than is it is true. now. Although yes. he's, he's had a resurgence a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> um, but we get more of Ginny. And at this point, I actually wrote down in my notes... I hope she dies. I hope she dies a horrible fucking death. Yeah. Please, God, just let her die. Because at this point, she hasn't even turned into the complete worst character in the movie, and yet she will. And this is already just shittiness upon shittiness. There's this moment where, so at this point, she's faking like she's passed out. Mm -hmm. And she's been faking that for like seven hours that that she's out. Yeah. And then Kurt goes to grab a glass of water and, and pour goes it to pour it. And she's like, oh, no, no, don't don't ruin my makeup. Like, don't don't pour that on me. And then she's like, wait, we're in California. I've always wanted to go to California. Oh, my God. Can, Can we go to the look beach? Around? I just want to go to the beach. I want to look around. I just want to do this. I just want to do that. I've never seen California. Once again, a cartoonish version of a kidnap victim not yes. understanding that why would they even let you why would they yeah. do that? Doesn't make sense. Nope. Although it is also weird too, I gotta be honest, because mm-hmm. when Phrase finds out they're going to California, he's like, I've never been to the beach before. And when we cut back to Dudikoff mm-hmm. and Phrase, they're exiting the brothel. Phrase is like, it's been a great fucking he's night. He's walking like with a swagger. Yeah. And then like immediately we cut to them pulling up in California and we do the Los Angeles like montage, which cracked me up because it'd be like (laughs) Los Angeles sign, 
Beverly Hills Hotel, <laughs> Santa Monica. And I'm like, th- that's like a five hour drive right yeah, there. Right? Then they cut to them at the beach. And I actually thought this was a really beautiful scene because they're mm-hmm. standing at the beach. Yeah. Um, Phrase is now looking at the beach for the first time. And he is crying. Yeah. And it was really interesting. Um, I, I've never experienced that because I am not landlocked. I've never yes. been landlocked growing up. I've always like Me either. taken day trips to the beach or whatever. And but I, I, I imagine that it would have an interesting effect. What also happens in the scene, which I think is really beautiful, mm-hmm. is he actually attaches the body of water to something else because mm-hmm. he's looking at it and he's overwhelmed. He starts crying, and then he says this thing about like, "I got accepted to Columbia, but I can't afford it." Yeah, and you know, like. My life is ahead of me, and there's so much change, and there's so much So much happening. to experience out there. So much to experience, and, and I don't know, and I've already started changing so much on this trip. Like, I had never kissed a girl before we left, and now not only have I kissed one woman, I've had sex with another. And, mm-hmm. like, I actually thought this was another one of those really beautiful moments in that um, I can imagine in a lot of 80s and 90s movies, the Dudikoff character being like, Bro, fucking man up. Oh, shit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And are you crying? Are you crying? There's no crying in Rescue Me. There's no crying in Rescue Me. <laughs> but what ends up happening is Dudikoff really reaches out, and they have, like, a really lovely conversation in this moment about the future, about being an adult. And Dudikoff has this really great line where he says, being an adult isn't just kissing girls, mm-hmm. which I think is fascinating because it's about responsibility. Yeah. And I think... What Dudikoff is actually getting at is, like, him growing into an adult on this trip is not the fact that he kissed a girl and had sex with a girl. Mm-hmm. It's the fact that he is trying to do the right thing yes, um, by saving and rescuing this girl, mm-hmm. which, I don't know, I just thought that, like, yet again, it was just another really lovely moment. It is. It is. And it, it's much deeper than I imagine people would give it credit for, because it does. Yeah. it does feel like... To me, at the time, and and maybe this was me just being a passive uh, audience member rather than putting a little bit more thought into it like you did, but it almost felt forced and expositional. I don't. I, it is. I think it's. It is. I think it's actually the best place they could have put the conversation about college and all of yes. that into it to have that be right there and have the limitations that he has lived with all of his life being broken absolutely being broken well and he also mentions in that moment too speaking of college that he wants to go to columbia but he mm-hmm. can't afford it yes and he has chosen to go on this journey rather than go to the scholarship test which is which is to tomorrow happen, yes which is tomorrow and he has decided that saving Ginny is more important mm-hmm. than a scholarship test right so it's weird because you're not wrong in that it is expositiony and it's not perfect in the way that it is presented. Yeah. But I will also say too that there is something really lovely about what I think they're actually going for thematically, which yes. is why yeah. in some ways I really love the Dwarf Dudikoff movie. Yeah. And really hated the Ginny Rowdy movie because it took the Ginny Rowdy movie is, out of things. Well, and and this is again a segue because yeah, Dud- Dudikoff and Dorf fall asleep on the beach. Mm-hmm. Um, they want to sleep outside, and then Ginny and Rowdy we cut there, and Kurt is like, "I'm gonna go outside and get some Thai food." Sure. And Ginny again is like, "Let me out, let me out," and he's like, "No, I'll come with you. I won't do anything. Like I just, yeah. I'm totally gonna be." What did she say? She said. I'm totally going to be grounded like when I get home. So I'm yes. never going to see the beach again. So why won't you let me? Jizz. Which, which, first of all, her father owns a bank and she has never been to the coast. Really? I mean, I don't know. Nebraska's man. I mean, I, I just highly doubt that there has not been a trip to the coast. Will they ask for a half a million dollars ransom? And the dad's like, I got it. I'll give it yeah, to you right totally. now. Yeah, totally. I'm on it. Early on in the movie. So, like, it's not like he's poor. No, and it's not like he uh, feels like he is uh, conservative with his money. He probably takes yes. him out on fucking... Anyway, it doesn't matter because she is... Speaking of which, I just now realized yeah. that we never check back in with the dad no, or the FBI. not at all. Again in the movie after the scene where Phrase gives Todd... The keys The back. keys yeah. to his car. No, not at all. But at that point, we get yet another ridiculous scene with Ginny seducing Rowdy, saying, hey, can I take a shower? Him, you can watch me. Him being an idiot, he says, so throw your clothes out. 
so that I know that you're not going to run away. Great, good. Also, I want to point out that he is eating chips out of Captain Crunch box. So I don't know what the fuck is going on with that. <laughs> I didn't realize yes, that. Yes, absolutely. And they're called Crunchies, and yet they have the Captain Crunch little guy next to him. And I don't, I, I'm pretty sure that Captain Crunch never made a chip. Chip. Well, I mean, I, I recognize the Captain Crunch box. I didn't recognize the chip. Oh, he that pulled is... out a full, full tortilla, like Dorito looking chip. Wow. Regardless, though. She then. Oh my God! I just looked it up. Captain Crunchies. No, made really. Chips. All right then. No, no, I was kidding. I oh, like, you I son of a bitch! That's great. That would have been that hilarious. Is, that was really I honestly funny. was gonna look it up, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, I was alive during that time. I'm sure I never. Remember. I would have had that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I would definitely would have eaten that. Oh yeah, lovely. So she goes and takes this shower. That who who would possibly think that this is a fake out? And, of course, it is. She sneaks out of the window with a towel on and her, uh... Oh, and there's that creepy-ass scene when she's throwing her clothing out onto the bed. And Oh, God, and, and the dude's rowdy smells like, her underwear. He doesn't smell it, but he, like, holds it up and, like, then decides to almost fold it or some bullshit. You know he took a sniff. He definitely took a sniff. Yeah. She sneaks out... Which, at that point, she has been wearing for, like, four straight oh, days. Oh, God. She sneaks out the, the very unlocked and open window in a towel, and she takes her boots, right? She Yeah, she brings her boots with okay, her. Okay, so that is confusing for later on, but let's put a pin in that. Because then she goes over to probably, I would assume, Don Johnson's laundry. Oh, it is Don Johnson because Don establishes that she's from Ohio. She mentions it several times. Exactly. And when Ginny steals her stuff, she yes. puts it on and goes, what, is this woman from Nebraska? <laughs> yeah, that was hilarious. Uh -huh. That's, that was which, the beat. Which is very funny because she actually was conscious for when Don Johnson first introduces herself. That is true. Remember? So she would that have known true. that she was from Ohio. So Ginny is just not a person who pays attention to the details. She then shows up just somehow at the Santa Monica Pier. Yes. In that clothing. Which, again, I think they said they were in Venice and they were at the Santa Monica Pier all of a sudden, yep. which is not a short walk. No. I mean, we are being L.A. snobs when we talk about that. And most people would just assume that there's like a pier or, or at least like because they don't they don't call it the Santa Monica Pier. It's just a pier. But it's absolutely the Santa Monica Pier. Oh, yeah. No, we know because we're L.A. snobs. Um, so it makes sense now mm -hmm. because she has been kidnapped. She's been taken across state lines. Mm -hmm. She's 17. She's gotten out of a harrowing situation where a man has tried to murder her on several occasions. And possibly sexually assault her. So what's amazing now is she does run to a phone booth, begs some change off of people, yep. and makes a call to the police to help her situation and I'm... get out and remain safe. And that would be completely logical if she had actually done that, Nick. What? Yeah, what? she does not... What? I had thought throughout the whole thing when she was saying, please just let me to the beach... That was a ploy to get out, uh, but uh -huh. then my note was she legitimately wanted to go to the beach instead of calling the police or her fucking family. Yes. She goes to the pier. And there's a rock concert going on. Finds a hot guy playing. Naturally. In a band. Yep. And rather than take care of herself mm -hmm. when her world is at crisis, mm -hmm. she decides to go on spring break. She's fucking, she's Gen Z. Gen she is Z. Gen Z in the middle of a goddamn pandemic. Oh my God, it me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, are you big kidding mood. me? That is a big mood if I've ever fucking heard it. I... Because are, she call, she even calls her stupid friend and says, yes. oh my god. I'm in I'm in California, and there's a really hot band guy. Oh my don't god. tell my dad. Don't tell the police. Hey, please don't. Come on. You're going to ruin it for me. This is like my vacation. Like, are you oh, god. kidding me? And so, I mean, she's almost 18, so she's almost uh, smart, apparently. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, she no. basically goes on a date with the lead singer of this band. Yes. Oh, that's right. She actually went on the date with him before she called her friend because she yes. finds out that the guy has a beamer. 
Oh my god, you don't know what a Beamer is? It's a BMW. Then we cut back to Kurt coming home and being like, she's gone? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I guess we're gonna have to solve our problem. He grabs a pillowcase. Sure. Um, And then we cut to Mm -hmm. Dorf and Dudikoff. Actually, we cut to Dorf on the beach and waking up and realizing Dudikoff that's right did not sleep on the beach next to him and another guy is like trying to steal shit from his pack that he's using as a pillow not yes. not the greatest idea no stupid there's better beach ways around man. that one stupid beach man and then once again this is this is another one of those moments in the script leaning so much on coincidence because dorf gets up and he walks confused looking for where uh dudikoff went also, I actually really liked that moment right when he's walking off of the beach. He's looking nervous, and it's like a super close-up on him. Uh-huh. It felt almost uh, Spike Lee-ish, but it, it was a really interesting shot showing his nervousness and his mm-hmm. uh, l- lack of control of the situation. Completely in yeah. juxtaposition to Ginny's, it's cool, I'm here. Yeah, whatever. And, and, I'm just, like, going with the flow. And then his, like, oh my god, this is terrible. I've been abandoned. But then he walks around for probably 30 seconds of screen time and just finds Dudikoff. Well, it's established earlier on in the movie that he could find Dudikoff wherever Dudikoff is at. Is it because of the echolocation that he has in his brain? Yeah, Yeah. I mean, once you see somebody drop off what you think is drugs to somebody else, you could find them at biker bars. Naturally. You could find them anywhere. They're drawn to each other. They're kindred spirits. So he, Um, he, he runs down and he actually just jumps into the... Oh, by the way, we didn't establish before, but Dudikoff, when they make it back into town with the motorcycle, he traded the broken motorcycle for a big brown truck. And at this point, Dorf runs and he jumps into the back of the truck and he hides under the the truck as the truck is moving, of course, because he's a very fast runner. We established that early on, right? That he's a track runner. Yes. Yeah. No. no. It did oh not shit. Okay. Also, he's light as a feather because I don't know about you, but if 180 pounds all of a sudden drops in the back of the truck, even if it's moving, oh yeah, yeah, it's gonna like bounce. <laughs> Especially if you're going that slow. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. So, a couple of things. A couple of things we could talk to the screenwriter about, yeah, or the director. It's whatever. Dorf is like, "What the hell did you do? Leave me!" Like, eventually yep. they get out of the truck. Yep. And dude, <laughs> dude, the cop is like. I had to get us breakfast. I was going to get us breakfast. Now, I question that. Do you... I mean, was he actually abandoning him so that Dorf was not in the danger zone? I think... Um, I'll put it this way. Yeah. He either was telling the truth about getting breakfast, or when he abandoned Dorf, yeah. the abandonment wasn't about, I'm just leaving you here and I'm going to go away, fuck you. Yes. It was... I am going to get the girl back yeah. so that way you are not in danger. Because That's he what I was thinking. Because he says yeah. that. To which Dorf says, and he points out, and it's quite true, how am I going to get the girl if she doesn't see me <laughs> help save you? You are not a soldier, kid. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you have not necessarily pulled your weight on all aspects of this trip. Not at all. Uh, you're not a great shot either. Uh, That's true. Yep. So they're at the place where the uh, the exchange the is, going down. is going to be going down. And at the same time that they get into position, Kurt and Rowdy show up in their busted ass vehicle to make the exchange. And then the rich guy from the call earlier, he shows up. In a limo. And they're on a dam, right? I think it's that Pasadena Bridge, isn't that? I, no, because one one part was a like a sheer cliff, and one part was a dam. It Was was it? I, thought that, I have no clue I where that's I thought it at. was up in the Hollywood Hills. Is that what that is? I think so, because I've done the hike up to the Hollywood sign, and I've seen one place that there is a big old dam, and that's the only oh. one I can think of. Damn, dude. I know, damn. Research AJ here, and host AJ was right. The shooting location for the final confrontation was the Hollywood Reservoir, also known as Lake Hollywood. It's located in the Hollywood Hills and is visible from the hike up to the Hollywood sign. If you ever get a chance, I would highly recommend it. It was built in 1924. It contains 2.5 billion gallons of water and is 183 feet deep. You can actually hike around it. It's pretty popular, so it wouldn't necessarily be the ideal place for an illicit exchange unless the parties involved dressed up as joggers. And where are you going to hide your ill-gotten gain in your Lululemon gear? All right, back to the show. 
But anyway, they pull up. I mean, it's a very conspicuous spot for yes. a, a meeting. I don't a know. A drop, yeah. But uh, they exchange the stuff. And then... <laughs> the trunk, the trunk of starts Rowdy's car, Rowdy and Kurt's car, just opens up. Yep. And Ginny gets out sure. and starts like running around with a bag over her head. Mm-hmm. Like, ah! <laughs> Phrase and Mac go through with their plan, and they start like smoke bombing them smoke and smoke bombing, th- fighting, shooting, shooting guns. guns. Yeah, all of the like rich bad guys either run away or get killed off pretty quickly. They actually and steal and Kurt's car and then roll yes. it real, real I, badly. I actually wrote down this turned real violent real oh, fast, so fast because people are getting shot and falling off the edge of the dam. <laughs> And landing on, like, the ground. And it's, like, a hundred foot fall. At, at least, There's yeah. There's no way they survive. No. And into the water, which is also no way they survive. Probably not. But there's this really interesting moment where Kurt and Mac mm-hmm. uh, pair off and start fighting each other. And they roll down a hill. And punch in and this, that, and the other thing. And then, phrase, phrase, Dorf picks up a gun in the midst of all this, like, through the smoke bomb, runs out. And he points the gun at Rowdy. Rowdy grabs Ginny. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's like, I got a human shield. You're not going to hurt the girl. Yeah, and you're not going to shoot your tiny kid. Jimmy, like, elbows him and runs away. Yeah. Um, Rowdy does have a shotgun, but it's not pointed at Dorf. Mm -hmm. And I think this is an amazing moment because Dorf is holding that gun at him and he's like, I'm going to shoot you. I'm going to shoot you. Yeah. And because of the scene earlier in the movie in the hallway. Where he, where he waited. Rowdy goes no you're not <laughs> and he lifts his gun up and points it at dorf yep which i thought was a really cool callback to that moment in the hallway of course this time dorf shoots rowdy in, in the, the stomach. stomach yep and i thought this is the stupidest moment in the movie <laughs> where he shoots rowdy in the stomach dorf drops his gun runs over and he's like oh my god are you okay i'm so sorry i didn't mean to shoot you <laughs> and rowdy is like no no it's okay and he just hands the shotgun over then he pulls a gun out of his waist and hands it over. Yeah, He's like, just, I'm done. Yep. I'm done. I'm going to survive. My stomach hurts a lot. So you just take all of these, whatever yeah. you need, kid. Yeah. Like he doesn't shoot at him or anything. Yep. And then we've got the triumphant moment. Yep. Dorf runs over. Oh. He rips off Ginny's pillowcase over her head. And she looks at him and says, you saved me. I love you. And then they kiss and the Nick, um, you're, music you're, swells. Nick, you're and... you're mis you're misremembering this. Wait, what? Ha- what? No, what? it was actually Don Johnson in that. Uh, yeah, oh, that's right. That's and right. what they had done is they had dressed Don Johnson up in the clothing that was left by Ginny. There was no reason. First of all, a couple of things. There was no reason that Ginny's clothes should have fit Don Johnson necessarily. Not saying they couldn't have, but yeah. that was ridiculous. Number two, we specifically saw Ginny leave with those fucking boots, and yet Don Johnson had those fucking boots on. Sure. And third... Yes. And this, I cannot... I cannot point to enough. Mm-hmm. They don't need a kidnapped girl at the drop. They didn't expect Dorf and Dudikoff to be there. They are not even confronting the FBI with the, the demands or, or anything, anything like that. There was absolutely no reason why that that woman the, should the, have they been needed there. a fake Ginny. In fact, it almost fucked up the drop because when fake Ginny gets out of the trunk and, and wanders around, around, the the guys like Whoa, 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 wait, what is going on here? The the rich bad guy is like, I guess people are into some weird stuff, but stop it. What what you, are you doing here? You. Stop it, you. Yeah, that was wild. Like, um what? But I, I, I also have to say, though, this is one of those places where, like, as stupid as it was, mm-hmm. I actually was surprised by the reveal. Yeah. I thought it was an interesting reveal. I was like, whoa, I did not see that coming. Right. No, exactly. And then I actually went back, like, it actually made me appreciate the leaving of the clothes Mm -hmm. in the shower scene even more. Because I thought it was a really good setup for a payoff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they could have they could have worked a little bit harder on the logic, but that's fine. Sure, yeah, sure. No. I I have a really important yeah. question. Go ahead. Do you think they forced Don Johnson to wear Jenny's four day old underwear? Sadly, yes. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> no, Rowdy probably kept it as a souvenir. That's true. Yes. Mm. Um, at this point, the dude, Dudikoff and uh, Dorf, well, it, it, are victorious. No, they're not, because. Here's here's another inconsistency that they, they never wrapped up 
after he finds out that Ginny is not Ginny, he hears a gunshot. And he's like, oh no, oh, Mac, what's happened? He runs down the hill. He finds Mac with a bullet hole in his shoulder and there's no sign of Kurt. Oh, I assumed Kurt died. Oh, you did? Yeah, that was my assumption. My assumption was the bullet shot was Kurt mm-hmm. and that Dudikoff was shot earlier. That was my assumption. I, I'm Interesting. I, I would have thought that they would have shown Kurt at one point or another, but they yeah, did it's a, not. It's a good question. But that's fine. I would have expected two gunshots then. That would yeah. have been cool. And <laughs> and that's the same time that uh, Dorf says to Dudikoff, he's like, oh, by the way, that was not Ginny up there. That is uh, some other lady. I don't know. And Dudikoff gives one of the best lines in the movie where he's like, LA is a weird place, kid. Yeah, was like, that line was great. Accurate. And then, out of nowhere, we cut to Dorf wandering <laughs> the city, I guess, yeah. looking for Ginny. Why Finds not? her immediately at the Santa Monica Pier. Because LA is a very on small the place. Carousel, kissing the band dude. And he looks at her and he's like, What the fuck? You, you stupid asshole i got a like, i got a lot of last american virgin vibe from this from this ending yes yes but at least in last american virgin mm-hmm. when the main character like there is like a romantic connection yes. between the main character and the girl so when she does kiss the other boy mm-hmm. there is reason for him to at least feel like oh fuck that's not the way i thought that was gonna go oh yeah it's because much weirder. they had actually kissed in the movie because yes. in this movie she sees him try to save her once mm-hmm. and then it's not saved yep. she has no clue that he has been following her or tracking her in fact and she look, rescued herself as stupid she as she rescued was herself yeah and the look he gives her is you how stupid dare cow. you how don't you know what i've done for you yes yeah and i was like at this point i wrote down wait is the theme of this movie that women fucking suck (laughs) and then i started thinking that the writer who we haven't mentioned his name a man named mike snyder okay i was like did mike snyder write this directly after a breakup (laughs) because like every time he kisses a girl dudikoff is like man girls are fucking terrible you better watch yourself oh Oh, this is gonna be stay away from girls man yep (laughs) after he finds Ginny kissing the other guy and he's like incredulous about it he goes to the hospital to visit Dudikoff and brings him flowers (laughs) and that was the most awkward thing ever but it was it was really actually funny because it was like a kid knows that you're supposed to bring people flowers when they're in the hospital and yet when he gets there with him he's like I I don't know why I it's it's kind of it's kind of interesting because it's analyzing like wait why do we do this that's kind well, of weird. Yes. Well, there's also a great point where when he gives the flowers over to Dudikoff, Dudikoff looks at him and like just chucks him in the corner. Yeah, yeah, basically. Like, I like, don't know what I, to do with I these. I don't know. Thank you, though. <laughs> My assumption is he actually bought those for Jenny. Oh. And then, and then was like, damn it. I guess I'll give them to you. <laughs> um, and this was a nice little moment, too, mm-hmm. where things wrapped up. Because at this point, Dorf shows up with a backpack and he says, this in this bag is not only the money that Kurt and Rowdy stole from you at the beginning, at the beginning of the movie, sure. it's also the money that Kurt and Rowdy were going to get for selling the stamps. Mm-hmm. It's all here. It's yours. You can go live your life. Um, and you earned Dudikoff it. And Dudikoff is like, well, some of that's yours. Don't worry about it. And he was like, no, no, no it's all yours. Nope. Um, and then Dudikoff goes, the stamps? And Dorf is like, and I, I toss those in the river. Yeah. They're gone. He's like, yeah, I guess that's fine. Yeah, Dudikoff's like, yeah, fair enough. Damn it. It would have been nice to sell them again. Yeah, fair, <laughs> but, you know, last time. I guess. And at this point, there's a really great moment where Dudikoff reaches into the bag, mm-hmm. pulls out the hat that Dwarf was wearing in the movie that uh, Dudikoff was like, you cannot wear this hat yeah. unless you, you haven't earned earn it. it. Yep. And he puts it on the kid's head. Yeah. Dudikoff puts it on Dwarf's head. And Dorf is like, oh my god. Daddy. I mean, dude yeah. cough. Dude cough. <laughs> Daddy cough. Daddy cough. Oh no. <laughs> oh my god. Mm. A daddy cough now would not be good for no. our fathers. No. Oh gosh. Not amid. No daddy coughs. No daddy Knock coughs. Knock on wood. No daddy cough. No. <laughs> uh. So finally, we are, I, I believe, finally wrapping up this movie. Yes, where we are back at the school. Yep. And Jenny's like, Hey. You want to hang out sometime? And Dorf is like, nah. 
and he goes over to his loser friend, yep. and then he goes over to like a girl that we saw in the movie in the science like, class, and he's like, "Hey, hey, girl, what's your name?" She's like, "It's Hillary," and he's like, <laughs> "Oh, Hillary." And then over the PA, we hear Fraser come to the principal's office immediately. <laughs> goes to the principal's office, and in the principal's office is his mom and Carney. And- Carney's back! Um, The principal, long story short, too late, basically says, you've been given a full ride to Columbia. Mm -hmm. Everything is paid for. And I thought this part was stupid. Because Dorf is like, who would do this? And the principal, like, spends four minutes looking at the piece of paper. They could have absolutely cut to an insert shot. They absolutely should have. And she goes, Daniel Mac McDonald. Do you know him? Daniel Mac McDonald. Jesus Christ. Dorf is like, I do. Which, <laughs> if Carney is sitting there, yep. Dorf should have realized who gave him the money. Yeah, I mean... At which point, school is in session. <laughs> currently in session. Yep. Dorf gets up out of the principal's office, walks outside, walks off campus. Like, where is Dorf going? Who knows? Next thing you know... Dudikoff is watching him on the motorcycle. <laughs> Dorf walks past Dudikoff, doesn't see him. Dudikoff starts the motorcycle. Mm-hmm. Dorf, you know, doesn't look around. No, nope, he just to see... he keeps fist pumping. Ah, oh, yeah. 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 And at this point, I'm like, first of all, why is Dudikoff parked on the campus? <laughs> right. How does Dudikoff know that Dorf is finding out at that exact moment? I guess he might have. Carney. He, went, he went with Carney, like, yeah. But that does force us to ask the question, uh-huh. how does he know that Dorf is going to walk out It's the middle of the day. Moment? School's in session! And walk past him and then not say a word, just right away on his motorcycle. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how the movie ends. And that's how the movie ends. And, and by the way, it costs about $75,000 to go to Columbia per year, just, uh-huh. just for reference. So how much do you think those fucking stamps were worth? I mean, well, I know that there was a lot of hundreds and thousand dollar bills in that uh, that briefcase, but great question. Jesus the fuck Christ, knows? whatever. Oh my god, yeah, good times. Uh, yeah, I I didn't hate this movie. Yeah, well, let's start with uh, what would you steal? Yeah, um, I actually have a couple of things. Um, I do too. I loved the rowdy standoff, the, uh, yes. the rowdy and dwarf standoff uh, parallels. And also, I, I, I especially yeah. love that even more when it paid off at the end. Absolutely. But I think that there was a very interesting, you know how they didn't really bleed over too much? Like you said, it's two separate movies. Mm-hmm. I think that that was a very interesting point where they made the bad guys serious. Yes, you know, they weren't goofy. They were, they, and that's kind of what it should have stayed like. But maybe, yeah, absolutely. It, maybe it wouldn't have been as entertaining on the other end. But. I also loved the the pushing the bike in the rain. I thought that yep. that was such an interesting scene. Uh, and I know that I said, um, oh, the parallel calls. Yes. I loved that. So, uh, um, yeah. How about you? I liked several of the conversations between Dudikoff and Dorf yeah. in the quote-unquote quieter moments of the movie. Sure. I really liked the shot through the broken glass made by the bullet hole in the door. That was cool. I really loved the shot when the motorcycle hit the log because I thought that was big time. I also liked the repercussions of that, which we didn't quite highlight earlier, but to connect the dots, which I think is important, is the fact that I think in most movies at the time they would have just hopped back on the motorcycle and gone. Yeah, yeah. But the fact that there was actual damage done to the bike because of the log hitting it. Caused a real thing to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I liked that. Mm -hmm. Um, I really liked loved the juvenile division dea moments <laughs> yes um and i also thought even though it wasn't perfect the reveal of dawn um yeah. was clever oh um, i think so too i found that to be surprising mm-hmm. um the reveal of dawn as jenny it makes no sense in the movie but i was like whoa fuck that got me <laughs> um do you recommend this movie? Yes, I would. I wouldn't say it's a uh, it's a must watch, but uh-huh. but I think uh, you you and I have had to watch these movies on our own instead of yes. in the same room together. I think I would have enjoyed it more had you been in the room. 
I wrote the same exact thing as I think with you, I would have loved this movie by yeah. myself. I tolerated this movie. Exactly. Because there are some, I, and I don't think we talked about it, but maybe it is evident by the way that, uh, We've droned on and on about it, but this movie slogs. This movie probably could yes. have been an hour fifteen. Yeah, I think had had they cut out some things, it's just a little slow for me. It is at times, yeah. Especially, I felt like it really got slow when it went back to the Kurt Rowdy Jenny stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that stuff would have been funner if I could have been sitting next to you screaming, "What the fuck is happening?" Yeah, it would have passed way quicker. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in that sense so mm -hmm. i don't want to say i didn't enjoy the movie no. but i also again i think it's the same thing where it's like not quite a ringing endorsement <laughs> but it's also like if you are a bunch of roommates yes. hanging out together in quarantine <laughs> this is a great watch it is um it is. but by yourself yeah might, might be a bit of a it's a little a tougher. slow one yeah yeah but uh all right all right well, good yeah at this point i think um this episode might actually be as long or longer than the movie itself, well, which the movie was an hour and 38 minutes. Well, I hope it was more uh, entertaining. Yeah. That's what too. I do hope. Uh, I hope it too. I hope. I hope. I hope. Uh, well, Quarantine episodes are supersized episodes. Yeah, really. Because we're so starved for yeah. contact. We There's nothing else we can do. No, exactly. <laughs> All right. Uh, and hopefully there's nothing you can do, but listen to us and feel better about life. That's the one that we want. Exactly. Yeah. All right, Nick, what are we doing next time? What are we watching? Oh, next time, AJ, I, um, it's, I mean, it is that time of year where we get stuffing and mm -hmm. cranberry sauce and, you know, that means turkey is coming around. Oh, that's ominous. Yeah, it really is ominous because remember last year when you made me watch Thanks Killing and I was so fucking mad at you? And I, I said, do. As punishment, I'm going to make you watch Thanksgiving every year we do this podcast for Thanksgiving. I was hoping that you had forgotten that. I did not forget that, AJ. And Damn. that is what we are doing! 2009's Travesty! 2009's Abortion of a Film! <laughs> All right, sounds good. Um, I'm sad to, uh, I am to have sad that too. on the... Uh, on the horizon but uh happy almost thanksgiving fantastic gobble gobble motherfucker yeah damn it what have i done all right that sounds fantastic i'm excited for that nick where can we follow you you can follow me at nicholas c pappas on twitter and on the forever under construction website nicholas c pappas Com. Lovely. And you can follow me at the AJ Hamilton on Twitter and Instagram. You can find my website at the AJ Hamilton.com. And is it under construction? It's under construction constantly. Of course, all, awesome. all websites are. Don't you worry about it. That is true. Uh, you have a point. Follow us at Creating Canon on Twitter and Instagram. That's C A N N O N. And you can email us at creatingcanon at gmail.com. We're also if you prefer youtube you can listen to all of these episodes on youtube uh, it's pretty cool and as we always say at the end of uh, the episode what do we say good, good night night and good canon that's much harder when we're not in the same room it is it's much much harder so anyways my back is like oh you're my little bitch yeah those d's kill you bitch mm. my butthole Pull my bum shape that to where it sounds funny happy pooping happy pooping go 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 the cats don't care the dogs don't care rescue me horses like salt keep shaking those hands idiot we are being recorded Wait, what? Somebody once told me the world was going to roll me. I'm just going to get a quick wank in. Come on, rescue me! Hold on. If you get a quick wank in, I'm going to get a quick wank in. <laughs> and you can follow me a... I don't know. They wanted a scene where Judy Dench was looking. Nope, take that out. <sighs> Anytime you can mention Odd Couple 2, you should mention it. Dorf for Judicoff. Exactly. Here's Dorf. Can't you see... That I'm a lonely and quarantine. <laughs> <laughs>